Hello, everyone. Welcome to Nails and Beauty Talk. I am your host, Asia the Bird. To have a very special guest with us today, she's a nail artist. Please welcome Natasha. Hello, Natasha. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you. You are most welcome. So I want to go ahead and ask where are you originally from and how did you get started into nails? Um, so I mostly grew up in Melbourne. Um, I lived in Hong Kong for a little bit. I have a background in bartending and hospitality. Um, I did do a makeup course and a little bit of um, illustration and design as well. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly I spent about six years bartending. Mm -hmm. And then towards the end of that is when I transitioned to doing nails, um, firstly on the side, but then eventually because of lockdown, um, I was able to do that full time. Cool, cool. Now, who are like your favorite nail artists? Um, I really like, I may be pronouncing these wrong because I mostly just know them by the Instagram handles. Mm -hmm. But I think Asa Brie. Mm -hmm. Maybe is her name. Um, Crocane, of course. Yeah, Crocane. Um, I really like um, Maddox, Ball Pit Addict. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think she's Ball Pit Nails now, maybe. Yeah, Ball Pit Nails. Like, she does really good, amazing artwork. Her work is amazing. Yeah. Um, Kai32, who I think is in Japan. Uh, Samsung Nails, who's a very good Korean artist. Her work is amazing. Super, super fine detail. Mm -hmm. um, there is honestly so many. It's kind yeah. of hard to name them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. I'm the same way. Like, there's so many good nail artists that are out there, you know. But yeah, like Samsung Nails and Crocane, like how you mentioned, um, Ball mm -hmm. Pink Nails. Um, Viv Shu, she does like really cool nail art, like that realistic portrait art that's on nails. That's really, really cool. Now, I also want to get into um, in terms of what has been your whole experience on your own nail studio? Um, well, actually, I just work from my home. Oh, okay. So in that sense like I mean it's still kind of similar mm -hmm. I definitely don't manage anyone else um which is my preference but you know there's always pros and cons so you have to wear a lot of hats and do a lot of things yourself um and like learn a lot of adjacent skills and do a lot of unpaid kind of you know like marketing and social media and all that kind of stuff but I think I would still prefer that than either working for someone or managing other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool working from home. Like, you, like, do you have like your own space? So you have like your own space where you have like, you know, it's you and just the client and things like that. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. I'm video chatting you at the moment from where I work. So I just work from my living room, which oh, okay. mostly serves the purpose of my studio space. Mm -hmm. So I want to get into the name. So I like the name Claws and Effect. What made you like bring up the name Claws and Effect? Thank you. Um, I don't know. I've just always quite appreciated pun business names. Mm -hmm. So I had to have one, I guess. Oh, cool, cool. Now, how could you describe your nail art style? Like, how do you like to work in terms of nail art? How could you describe your style? Um... I think I like to use things that kind of interact with light a little bit. So mm -hmm. things that have like clarity or like interesting finishes, like chromes, mm -hmm. transparent things, um, iridescent stuff. That kind of thing is probably my favorite personally. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of the time clients will come in with an idea or inspo photos. So mm -hmm. Sometimes you get a little bit of creative freedom. Sometimes you kind of have to work with what they want. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people want, you know, exact recreations. In terms of like the no education, like how big is the no education or the no industry in Australia? Um, it's not ideal, I guess. Um, it's getting better, especially over the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. um Australia generally just takes a little bit longer to catch up with the rest of the world mm -hmm. um and yeah it's the same with nails I think partly we have a smaller population 
than you guys and then most well, Asia I'd say probably every Asian country we would have a smaller population Australia's right. definitely like the ratio of um land mass to people is makes it sort of not super worthwhile for companies to ship over here because it costs a lot of money we're far away there's a lot of um border security laws mm-hmm. so it's a little bit difficult to get um products and then I think because of that uh not as many brands would have education I've noticed that a lot of like individual brands will have classes in the states that teach you how to use their product Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot less of that here Mm -hmm. um and the courses that are around most of them are quite dated um some of them are like the bigger ones might be like a beauty therapy course that has like maybe just a two-week component on manicures Mm -hmm. um and that will technically give you the qualification but it's not going to teach you much about actually um doing nails but there is stuff around you just have to really look for it and dig around Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i see now what about the license do you have to be licensed in australia to do nails or you don't have to be licensed like how's that work um it varies from state to state so in victoria there is no technical legal requirement i think it's different in queensland but yeah, the state that I'm in, you don't technically need anything. Okay. So for the most part, any certifications and stuff you get won't be like government official. It'll just be from whatever person has taught you. Now, in terms of nail education, what would you like to see like be improved within nail, within nail education? Probably just more options mm-hmm. for... Um, I guess the government certified courses, even though it's not a legal necessity, it would be good to have more Mm. options so people could get them um, without doing necessarily like a really long course where like 90% of the information is redundant. Um, Mm. And I guess just like more specific techniques, like more niche cuticle classes. There's one that I know of um, in Melbourne that I did with a Russian lady and then there's one in Sydney that I would still really like to do one day Mm. um and I think there's a couple of good ones up in Queensland as well Mm -hmm. all right now in terms of having your own home salon now what has been your experience working with different clients especially with different nail beds especially with nail art and things like that providing nail services um Learning to work with different nail beds has definitely been challenging. Um, That I feel like is something that you kind of have to learn with experience and practice Mm -hmm. because it's really, really difficult to cover everything, um, you know, because you're going to need a course that's long enough that you'd be able to, you know, go into detail with every type and usually you need like an example of each client, which is going to be a pretty hard thing to do logistically. Right. Um, so I guess I've just learned that in the process on the job. It's been really helpful um, having Facebook groups that have other nail techs that will give you support, especially the ones that are specific to like the products that you use. So I mostly work with gels um, mm-hmm. and I'm a member of a Facebook group run by Paula Ponce mm-hmm. and she specializes in a lot of um, Japanese and Korean gels um, and she does a lot of YouTube videos. Mm-hmm. That's very useful. Um, In terms of art for different clients, it has definitely been interesting seeing uh, like the different personality types that tend to get different Mm -hmm. looks. Like some people will come to me specifically for stuff that like I do. Right. Um, Some people come to me who just want nail art in general and because it's like not really that easy to find here compared to maybe the States. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, like you do get, I guess, a wider range of clients that may not necessarily be in your niche but Mm -hmm. um I do like the variation and I like the challenge sometimes okay all right that's understandable now in terms of your nail business so you sell press-ons and also cuticle oil so what has been your experience also having your own nail business um it's definitely kind of like an adjacent business that's Mm -hmm. still relevant but I feel like I do often have to clarify that they're separate things because people do get a little bit confused 
Mm-hmm. Her sons aren't as much of a thing here that's well known as they are in the States. Like in the States, everyone knows what press ones are. They know that you can buy like handmade ones from nail artists. Whereas I think in Australia for a long time and still now, a lot of people, their only experience with press ones are like the ones you get from the supermarket that have a little French tip and they don't tell you how to put them on properly and they pop up after like two days. Mm. Um, so that was, it was interesting because you have to kind of do a lot of education mm-hmm. um which can feel a bit odd if you don't feel like it's your place to be educating right. people you don't want to be like condescending but people genuinely will ask a lot of questions and it's really hard to sort of figure out what sort of level of knowledge they're at so you know where to meet them mm-hmm. right now I want to get into the marketing. Like what has what has worked for you in terms of marketing and putting your work out there? Um it just took a lot of time for me to grow my Instagram gradually. Mm-hmm. I probably could be a little bit more regimented with um all the like social media algorithm appeasing, but I after like a bit of a slog of a couple of years after reaching like the thousand mark um once I had enough clients physically I really sort of peeled back from socials because it just wasn't really my priority Mm -hmm. um it definitely gets to a point where once you've physically filled your books there's not really a huge advantage to like putting a lot of time into growing a huge following unless your goal is to like be an influencer or scale mm-hmm. online, which may be something I do in the future, but at the moment, it's not really the next thing on my to do list. And mm-hmm. yeah, like Instagram can be quite frustrating. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess in terms of marketing, the only other stuff has been word of mouth, which is a really good one. Mm-hmm. Um, and with the press ons, I started on Etsy, and a lot of my customers were mostly from the USA. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I kind of agree with social media because it can be a bit frustrating, especially with the algorithm on Instagram and, you know, you're trying to put your work out there, but it's the same like stuff on your timeline, you know, so Mm -hmm. it can get hard where you're trying to get that traffic to get notoriety and stuff like that. And so like for me, I would use like I'm using ads. I'm getting into the habit of using like ads and paying for ads to get, you know, my platform out. And, And yeah, like and plus the whole thing is, is that you have all these different social media platforms. And when you try to get into all of them, it can be too much. So that's totally understandable. Yeah, there's um a pretty interesting YouTube video that I watched recently about um the problem with content creation. And it's just mm-hmm. a guy who kind of goes about on about um how it's difficult for people in creative industries and for artists because, you know, as much as it's a super powerful tool and it's a great platform that's never existed before that, you know, mm-hmm. can bring you direct to the consumer it also because of the nature of it and the whole algorithm thing it kind of makes artists and creatives have to sort of like alter their work Mm -hmm. to be appealing which really kind of I don't know it sort of waters down what they're doing sometimes and can take a lot of the focus away from their ability to have that space to kind of like play and just create right right yeah I could definitely agree with that now I want to get into in terms of the pricing so what has been your whole journey in terms of pricing your nail services and what advice would you give for someone who wants to price um their worth in terms of nail services especially with press-on nails um with the press-ons because I do them as well as taking clients like taking clients is like 95 percent of my business Mm -hmm. um and now that lockdowns are over the press-ons are very I don't do them that often because they are quite time consuming they take, I think, at least as long as doing an appointment in real life, if not longer, because you have to mess around with measuring and going to the post office and, right. you know, it's just a little bit um, fiddly. And because I have the time to be a perfectionist, I usually do. And then I just take, you know, a bit long to make it just perfect. Um, so I ended up pricing things until it was like a realistic level of work, if that makes sense. So if you're getting too many orders, put your prices up 
until you're getting an amount of orders that you can handle essentially Mm -hmm. um and I mean look it's the kind of thing where I think artists will hear this over and over again but it's really really difficult to actually practice you really just have to account for your time and your hours and you just have to like bite the bullet and price higher than you feel like pricing and it always feels weird Mm -hmm. um and for some reason it's hard to do but you kind of just have to do it right sometimes you won't do it for a while but then you will have to just learn to do it because otherwise you'll burn out or you won't really be having a sustainable business and you'll have to be doing other work so that you can do the job you like doing which isn't really you know great for the creative community but it's definitely it's something I think most people who do you know beauty service industry art I think it's something that a lot of people struggle with Mm mm-hmm now, I want to get into in terms of nail services, you know, do you charge by the hour or like, how does that work in terms of nail services, like gel enhancements or like nail art and things like that? Generally, I I sort of charge by time, but not exclusively because, mm-hmm. I mean, it's going to depend on removal and prep. I don't charge at the same rate as I would for nail art. Um, mm-hmm. And I try to kind of like keep everything relatively simple. So I have a tiered system where I'll do like a basic set, um, Lux, Hectic, and then if people want extras, mm-hmm. the extra time will be a dollar a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, but before that, usually nowadays I don't really do sets for under $90 Australian. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not 100% sure what that is in the States. I'd say it's probably around the $75, $80 mark. Mm-hmm. Um I used to have my basic sets price lower, but mm-hmm. I realized that I was spending most of my time on doing really meticulous prep right. um, and application, which takes up most of the appointment. So like you got to make sure you're covered for all of that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And I mean, they last a really long time and the products cost a lot more than what you'd find in other salons. So Yeah, I think it's important to charge accordingly. I'm lucky that I work from home, so I don't have to pay rent as well, um, like salon rent. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I can definitely agree. You want to charge what you're worth, and you're going to have to charge high because you spend a lot of time doing a set of press-ons. And, you know, especially, you know, with with the stuff that you use as well, because these are high-quality products. Like, you're using the gel bottle, using C&D, any you know, type of gel brand or nail brand in general, you know, you're going to have to price for that because these are materials that you're putting on for the nails to create a whole body of work on 10 nails. So that's something that's yeah. Very important. Yeah. And I think as well with Australia, like everything costs more here, like a gel bottle, bottle of color is about 37 to 42 Australian just for one. And I know, I think mm-hmm. over there in the States, it's about like 14, 10. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, the currency conversion might even it out a little bit, but, right. and also tipping isn't really a thing here. Mm. Um, so that's also a factor. But, yeah, there's definitely, like, an Australian tax. Yeah, yeah. With these products, they're very, very expensive. Like, you know, you get a gel, bo- gel bottle um, polish, that'd be, like, $20 or $17, like, for example, like, you know, if you get a and d nail polish bottle, it'll be, like, costing you $14 or $17. So, yeah, you know, yeah. Ain't cheap. yeah, and I hear over there, um, like, the prices of everything have spiked a lot because of gas, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gas prices went up. A lot of stuff has went up because of the pandemic. A lot of prices mm. like that. So, so, yeah, like, stuff isn't cheap. Like, you know, we're buying all these materials and things like that. And plus, we need funds to get more materials and things like that so that's something that clients have to take into consideration now in terms of what the nail industry what is your perspective of the nail industry and what would you like to see more of in the nail industry um I mean I think that it has gotten a lot better in the past couple of years especially mm-hmm. um I probably haven't been in it as long as you know like veterans who I'm sure could you know more accurately gauge Mm -hmm. changes over the last decade or so but um I guess just like more of the momentum that it's already got 
So like nail artists are actually like getting credit. They're actually getting credited when they do magazine shoots. Mm. Um, there's even such a thing as like celebrity nail techs, which never used to be a thing at all. Um, you know, there's a little bit of conversation about, um, you know, not expecting Instagram nails at like a walk-in salon for $20. And um, the fact that, you know, it can take different amounts of time, right. that it's an art form. Um, that it's not something that's, you know, like unprofessional and trashy and that it's actually like, you know, a valuable type of adornment that people have been doing for a really long time. Right. Yeah, yeah, I could definitely agree. Like, you know, fashion and fashion and nails has, you know, been getting big because like with nails, it's just as much of a fashion statement as the fashion garment. So fashion and nails, like when you combine the two, it creates that harmony. So that's really, really cool. But yeah, but also yeah. too, within the nail industry, there's a lot more products being out now, like, you know, faster UV lamps and 4D gel mm -hmm. and poly gel. So it is so crazy how the products have came like a far long way, you know, from how it was, you know, 10 or so years ago. And all social yeah. media, you know, you got celebrities wearing nails and, you know, of course, it's getting improved on in terms of us getting credit for the designs that we do. And I think it is important to continue that where we get credit for the work that we do so we get notoriety. Yeah, definitely. That's a really good point, too, about the improvement in technology. It's always really interesting seeing what new stuff people come up with to make our jobs easier and to allow us to do, you know, interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. But I think also, too, the licensing has to be better, too, and especially the nail education, especially globally, because I know, mm -hmm. like how you said, with, you know, where, where you live, you don't have to be licensed. And I think that should be very important. But also, too, you know, with here in the States, you know, you have to be licensed. So I'm mm -hmm. a licensed cosmetologist. So my hours are 1500 hours to get my license. And of course, with licensing, what could be better is that is not just trying to get hours so you can pass, it should be getting you fully equipped for the industry that you're jumping into, whether it's, you know, the whole beauty industry or the nail industry, whatever industry you want to get into in terms of the beauty industry with hair or, or aesthetics and things yeah. like that. So that has to be improved as well. I've heard that in America, there is strict rules with licensing and it's really expensive, but, and I'm not sure if this is a state thing or a federal thing, but I've heard that the actual courses often don't really teach you much technique it's more like a like a literal legal process and like bare minimum and then you have to like pay more to actually learn what you want to learn is that correct yeah yeah in terms of here in the states you do you know they do teach you the basics they don't teach you you know the full advancement of what you're studying like whether it's cosmetology mm -hmm. or nails so they won't give you the full scope of nails, like nail trends or like different nail shapes or different parts of, you know, different aspects of technology within the nail industry. And also to, you know, with licensing, like, you know, it does cost more now because you have to pay for continued education every time you mm -hmm. renew, you know, so that that's the thing, because now um, with the states that, that I'm in, they're adding, they've added continuing education. So you have to take an education course, whatever hours you have within within your state. Yeah, so um, that that's how that goes. But I want to get into in terms of your favorite nail products. So, what has been like your favorite nail products? Um, in terms of uh, like brands of gels or art or both. Um, it could be both. Um, so I really like to use a lot of Korean products. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a girl who has her own store here who imports a lot of stuff from Korea, um, which is great. Um, Luna Beauty, by the way, if anyone's interested. Um, and then I think Zillabo, Zillabu, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Mm -hmm. um, they're based in LA, I believe, but they also have some really nice stuff. So mm -hmm. I've recently been using uh, Fiote pro products. Mm -hmm. um, they have these little cute like hexagonal bottles. And I usually mm -hmm. use those for, um, have a few colors but mostly like overlays and base coats top coats stuff like that um I find their builder gels are nice and uh hardy for top coats and overlays um I use diamy for extensions usually and for painting and I usually use a prey tips 
because I find out of all of the soft gel tips, they have the biggest range um, of shapes and lengths. Right. Unfortunately, the sizing is a little bit inconsistent sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, they could definitely have bigger sizing for like the individual nails, but mm-hmm. overall, I still think they have the best selection. And it is nice to have a look that is very like cohesive as a brand if you're doing it professionally. And it probably does have that down pretty well. Mm. Um, as for art products, I just like using, uh, I do like using chrome powders and then mm. I do like using shiny iridescent things. And I don't know, a lot of like natural stuff, like natural stones, seashell, like abalone shell pieces, um, plants, stuff like that. Cool, cool. Yeah, I'm like a gel person. I like 40 gel. I paint like characters and, you know, no with acrylic paint, but also I use like gel as well um, sometimes. Mm-hmm. But I want to get into in terms of nail brushes, like what would you consider to be like your favorite like nail brushes to use, like, you know, ranging from like fine line or whatever type of brushes that you use? Hmm. So I have bought a lot of brushes and out of for liner brushes, honestly, out of all of the ones that I've bought, and I've got like these fancy, you know, like rubber handle Britney Tokyo ones. Mm. And like I occasionally will reach for the full coverage ones, but the liner brush is kind of whatever. And my favorite liner brushes that I always get are these little mm. cheap ones that I just got off eBay. They come in a pack of three. They've got a clear handle and they're just mm. these little like, I mean, you know, they're probably in terrible condition because I use them all the time, but they're like $7 and you get free. And they just look like this. Mm. And I always use them to like line art. Right. Um, and then for full coverage, I really like the Light Elegance Angle Brush. Mm-hmm. Um, what else? There's pretty good Presto ones too. Um, and I have a few. Um, what's the Russian brand? Is it Rub- Rublev? I think it's Rublev. Mm. But they do a lot of um, like sable hair ones, and they can you can get synthetic or real, right. but they're really nice too. Yeah, yeah. In terms of nail brushes, like the Britney Tokyo ones, those are really really good. Also, like Coco mm-hmm. and and you know their brushes, those are really really good. Very very good art brushes. You know Britney Tokyo. I love the packaging with her stuff because yeah, I, it's so cute. It's like red and it has like green like writing and stuff. The packaging is so good. Yeah, I have those ones. The ones that kind of look like they come in a box, like, of candy. Right. I've yeah. heard good things about the Cocoa ones. I'll have to try them. Yeah, the Cocoa ones are really, really good. Now, I want to get into, in terms of trends. So, there's a lot of trends that have been out. So, what would you consider to be, like, your favorite nail trends? Ooh. I really like the trend that is kind of recent, I think, but with the sort of like tribal tattoo sort of look right and like chromey iridescent stuff it's very sort of like y2k-ish mm-hmm. um and I mean when flames were huge obviously they were everywhere but I feel like they've stuck around so they're like a bit of a classic now which is cool right um yeah how about you yeah I like the snail eyes I love like the alternative French Um, I also like the tribal, the tribal designs and the flames and those have been out and it's really, really cool. Like the mixed color marble design. I find that Mm -hmm. to be really, really cool. I like how with nail art now as well is that it's very conceptual. It's very experimental and the possibilities are just like, you know, endless in terms of what you can use to create a body of work. You use like, you know, wire, yarn and, you know, different mediums. Like you use anything. Yeah, for sure. There's um, a nail artist. His Instagram handle is like Tomonyan, or t- I don't I don't know what part of it is the first name and what part is the last name, so I could be completely botching the pronunciation. Um, but their work is incredible. It's super conceptual and like avant garde, but mm. they're always like three D sculptural, very futuristic looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're really, really, really cool. Now, what's next for you? Like, do you have any, you know, plans in terms of like selling more press on nails? Like, what's next for you in your business? Um, at the moment, press ons I do do occasionally, and it's nice to have 
like it's nice making them because you can mm-hmm. sort of do it at your own pace put on music or a podcast and just kind of like take your time mm-hmm. um but for the most part I take clients in the future I would like to scale my business a little bit mm-hmm. um probably education because mm-hmm. I think there is a bit of a gap um for that here mm-hmm. um yeah I think there's a lot of demand for more specialized um classes and more specialized techniques and there's a lot of demand in general now for just having like fancy bougie nails that aren't your standard walk-in salon and there's more people who want it I think than people who provide it because it seems quite quick that other independent nail techs get booked out right so yeah I guess education would probably be a good move yeah, yeah. Education is very, very important. And especially you have a better understanding of different techniques and understanding safety and sanitation and things like that. Because those things, mm-hmm. are important, especially nail prep, because that helps with maintaining, you know, the client's nails and helping them last longer. So that makes a whole difference. Yeah. And the standard here for most um, walk-in salons is pretty bad. Like it's really standard practice. I'm not sure if it's the same over there, but um, for people to just come in to get a removal and they'll chuck a tip underneath and just kind of flip it off um or just standing band all the time for ages uh dipping with no sanitation in between that kind of thing it's all very common practice unfortunately yeah 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 that's not good you know and here in the states we don't do that stuff that's not that's not good practice no yeah that's not good no I've had some pretty bad horror stories I've had clients tell me that they've literally told them to stop and they've just kept going so scary yeah yeah that's not good now how do you balance work in everyday life how do you find that work balance um it's definitely something I still kind of tweak every now and then Mm -hmm. um some days I get quite busy and I'll kind of work pretty much the whole way through um I've learned to get a little bit better with giving myself an actual break to like have lunch and everything but I'm sure a lot of nail techs will be familiar with the grind of having your first meal at like 10 p.m um I've sort of got things a lot more relaxed now I think it was really important for me to adjust my pricing Mm -hmm. um because yeah throughout the November December period like it's great having a lot of clients and getting to do a lot of sets but even when you really really love your job you still burn out Right. Yeah. And I want to be able to perform like to the best of my ability. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there, there's definitely, you know, you can bring yourself out if you don't find that balance. And also mental health is very important. You do want to maintain your mental health while doing the nail services, you know, because mm-hmm. your health comes first. You got to find, yeah. that, find that balance. And that's something that us nail artists have to understand. It's very important. And physically taxing too, just because mm-hmm. looking at something close up all day, And sitting down for such a long time without moving much is really bad for your body. Like I have a lot of friends who are nail techs and they're like in their twenties and they've got back and neck problems. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to be really careful with that and make sure I don't, you know, overstrain myself. And it's hard when you do stuff for work because, you know, you work a lot. Right. So, you know, it's kind of, it's difficult, I think, for every job because every job has its thing Mm -hmm. that, is bad for your body and you've just got to kind of like find a way to counteract it as best as you can yeah yeah most definitely it's important to take care of yourself it's very very important self-care is very important now last but not least where can people find your social media and how can people support your work so my socials are pretty much just instagram um it's at claws.n.effect um on my bio i've got like links to all my other stuff which is I mean it's mostly just my Shopify but yeah I'm basically just on Instagram I do have a TikTok but it's kind of basic so I wouldn't say it's my first line of socials I mostly just use it to watch funny videos to be honest (laughs) yeah that's really really cool well thank you so much Natasha for jumping onto the show your work is absolutely cool thank you so much for sharing your story and your knowledge thank you so much Thank you so much, Asia. It was lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you too. Take care.
You too. Bye. Bye. -bye. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. Be sure to click the bell for notifications. Also follow me on my social media platforms and visit my website, asiaticbird.com and be on the lookout for more interviews to come very soon. Take care and stay beautiful.